Today we start with Euripides Trojan Women, which is a really phenomenal and very sad tale about the survivors of the Trojan War, who are chiefly women. Some notes to begin about generally the tragedy of the play. Um, in the fourth century BCE, there is a tradition, a story, if you will, that there is an, an, a tyrant whose name was Alexander. Not Alexander the Great, but a different Alexander. And he had a reputation of being very cruel in extraordinary cruelty in all forms of warfare. And so he had a reputation of being, uh, you know, a very um, uh, emotionless guy. Apparently, he had to leave a production of the Trojan Women in order to avoid having citizens see him weep. So that's just how sad it was. If you found yourself not necessarily weeping, but really feeling a lot of sympathy for those characters, that's exactly why. Um, in fact, the Trojan War served as an interesting prism through which ancient people could view um, the struggles of their own generation. At the time that Euripides wrote this play, um, he was writing sort of um, as a commentary on the wars um, that Athens was having both with Persia and with uh, Sparta in the Peloponnesian Wars. One of Euripides' great gifts um, is the idea that he uses everyday approachable vocabulary. So he uses a set of words that most people use to describe their situations, which makes him unique because anybody can listen to his plays and know what's going on and understand the plates of his characters. His approach to mythology, though, is subversive in a way from a cultural standpoint. Um, he's a little bit playful. He's experimental with things. Um, he is has been dubbed both a pacifist and a feminist. And I think that you can imagine that an ancient tragedian who is male writing an entire play about uh, women could definitely have earned that reputation. We're going to talk for a minute about Euripides himself. Um, not much is known. We know that he was born in about 485 BCE. We know that um, uh, Athens was at war with uh, Persia starting in um, 480. Well, I shouldn't say starting um, because that was actually their second invasion of Persia. Um, and then in 431, which makes Euripides approximately 34 or so, um, or 54, excuse me, um, Athens and Sparta undertook the Peloponnesian Wars with each other. Um, throughout the 420s or so, um, there was a lot of violence between the two civilizations. And then in 413 um, BC, um, a fleet um, it was tragically lost at Sicily. Uh, we know that Euripides died about 406 BC. So for the general majority of his entire adult life, um, his city of Athens was at war with a ho whole host of different people. Um, also, there is a notable incident at Melos. And during that war at Melos, uh, or during that war, um, Melos refused to contribute to Athens' side of the war. So Melos was technically an ally of Sparta, and Athens was trying to force their hand in cooperation. Um, and um, uh, Ath Athens was very angry at Melos's refusal. And so Athens actually attacked and killed almost every single person in Melos. They enslaved all the women, they killed all the men, and that was really just because Melos wanted to remain neutral and not align themselves with Athens, but Athens couldn't tolerate that. And so in a really uh, significant way, Euripides actually uses the Trojan War, or the Trojan women, excuse me, as a vehicle through which to accuse Athens of their war atrocities, and then to really force them to consider their guilt and to force them to consider what they've done and the toll that they're taking on other people uh, without possibly realizing it. It should be noted that Euripides, although he wrote this subversive um, type of play, and although he, um, you know, was was definitely, um, you know, criticizing a lot of politics, his plays were celebrated very widely. Every year there's um, a Dionysia festival, which was a festival to Dionysus, who was the god of wine and festivities. Um, it was a religious festival. It was also a political festival. And it helped Athens affirm their unity, and it helped them affirm their democracy. Um, 
And interestingly, and this is really terrible of ancient Athens, but the festival of Dionysus featured a very patriotic display of all the orphans that lived in Athens because Athens had killed their parents in battle. It really very, very terrible. But as the audience would watch this festival, they would say, oh my goodness, you know, I'm so proud of us. I can't believe we orphaned all these children. Ha ha, go Athens. And I know it seems sick uh, and I know it seems overly and unnecessarily violent, but that's exactly what Euripides felt like his place was. His place was to offer this um, thinly veiled commentary on where Athens was and what they were doing um, and really how horrific they were. Um, the Trojan women itself, interestingly, um, had a good reputation in the ancient world. Um, people loved it back then. But modern critics from the Renaissance through um, the better part of the 20th century panned it. Um, it lacks a certain what's called an Aristotelian plot. An Aristotelian plot is the kind of plot that you might have heard about when you were in, you know, a middle school or high school or something, where you have um, you know, explanatory actions at the beginning of a work, um, and then you have the rising action, and then you have a peak. You have some sort of incident that really, um, uh, you know, sets off the rest of um, the action and, you know, helps things come back down um, to resolution. It doesn't have any of that. It's just sadness heaped upon sadness heaped upon sadness. Um, and we do have this very, very wide demonstration um, of the accumulation of suffering. Um, so we don't have anything that drives it, any sort of, you know, um, uh, action really that drives it. Um, Hecuba's role is very strong, um, which is very odd, as you know, because ancient women's roles in literature were often considered, um, uh, uh, they were weaker in general. So it's interesting and unique to see Hecuba in such a strong and prominent role in the play. In fact, her performance requires a great deal of stamina. It requires a lot of intensity um, and, you know, not just remembering lines, but, you know, the ability to demonstrate that you have withstood the effects of an entire war. Her body, for the most part, is lying prostrate on the stage um, and that therefore represents the state of Troy itself. Um, the Greek philosophers often address the question in their philosophical works, how should we live? The church and war takes that question one step further to say, how should we live in a time in a world of war? And so the play really explores the ethics of war and it explores um, the culpability of war. Who do you blame when you are in a warlike environment? The women of the play, really, they gain nothing from blaming the metaphysical or the divine forces, right, the gods and goddesses. And yet they can't acquire any relief from blaming men. The men are not there. The men won't take accountability for their decisions and their actions. And so they have no one else to turn to but themselves. And they turn the blame onto each other as a method of processing and coping and to a certain extent answering that philosophical question of how should we live in a world of war. Women, you know, typically were confined by society um, and generally they didn't have any sort of ability to blame anybody, to be outspoken in, um, you know, a, a a way in which they're assigning blame to people. Um, you know, ideal wives, as you know, from both um, the Iliad and the Odyssey, they were sort of, you know, they were put on a pedestal as people who listened really well to what their what the men had to say around them and who were just very obedient and passive. Um, and so when women star preeminently in tragedies like this, they actually help patriarchal societies envision you know, the, the, the pros and the cons of their current social order. Euripides really plays on the vulnerability of women. He plays on the voicelessness of women. And he really creates very strong and memorable female characters for us, too. The opening of the play actually does not start with the Trojan women. Um, and in fact, it starts be with a conversation between Poseidon and Athena. 
And this is quite remarkable for us um, because it really shows that the gods are very much present in all of our dealings in the ancient world. So even if our play is really chiefly concerned with um, the human experience, it really just shows that the gods are always present um, in all these uh, problems that are happening with women and with humans. Um, in the conversation between Poseidon and Athena, um, they're talking about how after the Greeks had their glorious victory at Troy, um, they were under the leadership and the influence of hubris. Uh, hubris is the Greek term for excessive pride. And so they have excessive pride in their victory and they proceed to sack Athena's temple. As they sack Athena's temple, not only do they raid and try to steal all the gold that's there, but they also capture and rape Cassandra, who is a priestess, who not only was a priestess of Athena, but also was seeking refuge in a temple. And when you think about it, how dare you, you know, what, what were they thinking that would allow them to do it other than this really tremendous excessive pride? Um, this incident will be alluded to in the Aeneid, which we'll read next week as well. And so this incident opens us up to the play in which one of our primary considerations throughout the play is the idea that of the idea of vanity. Vanity is the state of having too much pride or being too vain. And I'm sure you've probably heard the expression of being vain before, you know, being self-centered and being consumed by yourself. And so vanity is the noun form of that word when you have too much of that pride. So the play really explores this fascinating angle that the effects of war are terrible for the victims, obviously, right? The conquered people are really suffering greatly. But those who are victorious, the conquerors, often suffer from vanity. They suffer from having entirely too much pride in the fact that they have been victorious. And so um, the play then becomes not just about Troy, but it becomes a statement on all men at war, um, all people who are at war in civilization, and in the case of Euripides, Athens, who is at war with both Sparta as well as Persia. Um, <clears throat> having the gods start the play, we talked about it um, a few minutes earlier, um, it demonstrates that the human behavior in war is not just noticeable to humans who are on the battlefield. In fact, the behavior in war, your behavior in war is actually visible to anyone who is in the universe. So number one, this points out to Athens that whatever they are doing that they think is some sort of innocuous action, this is making them look bad on a much more global level than they could ever realize. The second purpose of this though, is that this kind of focus removes the pretense and it also removes the relativity of time. So in our case, time is not exactly the most important thing so that we can have this account of war be applicable to other accounts of war. It doesn't matter what century we're in. It doesn't matter what country we're in. It doesn't matter who is fighting who or why. The fact remains that your actions in war are noticeable globally. Hecuba um, begins after the gods conversation with monologue and her monologue retells the glory of Troy that is in the past. It notes the cause of the war, you know, Cassandra notes that too. And then the gods conversation speaks to the future of society for both the Trojans and the Greeks. So again, we've removed the idea that this that this Trojan women thing takes place at a certain time, on a certain day, um, with, with some sort of measurable time aspect to it. Um, <clears throat> knowing about the Greeks' eventual demise, it really removes the shine of the victory that they've had. Cassandra, um, in the beginning of Trojan Women, predicts that the Greeks will suffer as much as they have made the Trojans suffer. And she's right. 
there will be a violent death for Ajax. There will be a violent death for Agamemnon. There will be loneliness. There will be terror for Odysseus. Um, the victory of Helen is both the cause and effect at the same time. So the Greeks went to war to win Helen back. So they got her, right? She symbolizes the victory but she also symbolizes the cause of the war. And so, you know, positing her as such a really um, a formidable force in the Trojan women um, keeps us in anticipation because she doesn't even get there until the end of the play for the most part. Um, but then we also have some commentary about the excesses of war. Um, and then we have some information about the reaction to achievements, right? So all of this stuff will be avenged and the suffering of the victim will be commensurate to the suffering of the victor. So in Euripides' play then, he is very famously and very, I think, astutely equating the role of victim and the role of victor through the lens of the loss that each one has experienced. Um, you know, both the victors, they will have lost property. I mean, you just read the Odyssey and Odysseus almost lost his entire kingdom to a whole slew of haughty suitors. The victims have lost their life. Um, but, you know, they have also lost their city, they have lost their homes, they have lost their belongings, etc. So we have both the victor and the victim suffering equally. Um, so, you know, the, the idea here is, is very, I, I think, cogent here, that when you have a victory, that that tends to engender arrogance, and arrogance tends to engender death. So Odysseus, interestingly then, fulfills a dual role as well, just like Helen. He's the cause of all the destruction to Troy, but he's also the recipient of all the destruction to his personal self, like his sense of self, his sense of well-being, his sense of peace. Um, <clears throat> you know, so the victims themselves, they the victims in the Trojan War, they really demonstrate the vast, vast range of suffering. They've lost their city. They've lost their life. Their, their suffering that they are currently feeling will also impact their new life too. Um, <clears throat> uh, one of the characters, Polyxana, is killed. We have a forced abduction of Cassandra. She will go home with Agamemnon. And then we have a very tragic murder of Astynax, who is the son of both Andromache and Hector. Hecuba presents a an argument that has emotional pain, and you can equate her emotional pain with physical pain as well. Hecuba's emotional pain is that of the crippled city. Hecuba's arguments also rest on the suffering of the potential future of the city. So, you know, she dis we discussed the fact that um, the city itself has been crippled. Um, we know that the city has been crippled based on the position of Hecuba on the stage. And now we also know that the future of the city is completely disabled and eliminated even because of the murder of Astinax, the one person who survived, who could have carried on the traditions of the city. The Greeks will encounter great suffrage too, however. Their fleet will burn with Ajax. Ajax is the one who invaded a Athena's temple in the first place. Um, storms await all of their journeys home. And then, of course, there's another Ajax who um, was, some of you are reading the play for your Bring Your Own Tragedy. Um, and in the Ajax play, he does not receive the armor of Achilles and feels so filled with shame that he commits suicide. So there is rampant, uh, really terrible consequences for all these Greeks, too, as they leave Troy. You know, they left their homes 
and they they abandoned their families. And then, you know, even if they survived the war itself, they still have to go home and they have to face the consequences of people potentially trying to usurp their power, possibly kill them when they remain home, which, spoiler alert, is the story of Agamemnon. So <clears throat> even at this point, Andromache, poor Andromache, she sings in the play that she would prefer death to a life that is void of hope. So you have to imagine the really tremendous suffering of these women, that it seems to her that the more favorable option would be death rather than a life without a future, without hope, etc. <clears throat> it's interesting to note, too, that most of the revenge that the Greeks are suffering from, the revenge actions, I suppose, it's enacted by the gods. It's not enacted by the victims themselves. So it's not as though these conquered women of Troy are, I mean, they might be wishing ill upon the Greeks, but nothing they can do can actually bring about, you know, the horrific tragedy that they are about to incur, occur, incur, excuse me. Um, but then because the gods are involved in this really extensive revenge, it naturally highlights the omniscience and the universal dislike of what has been done. So it's not even that, you know, the Trojans themselves are particularly personally offended. It's that um, the gods themselves having, you know, universal watch over our society, they are so disgusted that they, you know, enact these measures. Menelaus has a weird role in this because he embodies, for sure, the empty consequences of war. Helen, of course, is the first person who caused all this ruin, and yet she's the prize. She's the one that he's happy to get and go home with. So naturally then, the debate over Helen's fate is really quite central to the play. Menelaus himself obviously does not know what to do with her, which, you know, if you know the character of Agamemnon enough, you know that it's not entirely surprising that Menelaus is just, you know, sort of lost. He kind of wants to kill her. He wants her to have the suffering that the Greeks have had for nine years trying to get her back. He wants her to feel the fact that, um, you know, she abandoned him in some way, shape, or form. He wants her to feel really terrible, violent consequences because he, as a Greek and his men, felt terrible consequences for her loss. And yet, she's the prize. He's the reason they went there in the first place. She was the goal. So the fact that they won the war means that they, he now gets to take her home. That's what he came here for in the first place. And then, of course, the fact that we're really arguing over one woman and whether or not she actually left on her own volition, this truly, as far as Euripides is concerned, is demonstrating the extraordinary futility of war. What purpose are we all fighting for? Is it legitimate enough? And here you are with Menelaus, that the prize is also the cause. You know, the reason he got into this mess is the thing that he's gaining at the end. Is it really worth it then? Is it worth it to have caused all that damage? <clears throat> so justice, in its own sense, becomes the quest at this point. Now, as we're thinking about the notion of justice, what is just? How are we going to make sense of this war? What is just for the victim or the victor? We haven't even seen Helen yet. So all this has been taking place without her even appearing on the stage. We have been tantalized the whole time to see her finally, maybe, maybe now, maybe now. Even Hecuba, though, advocates that Menelaus should probably decide her fate before he lays eyes on her. And this is because of her almost curse at this point to be the most beautiful woman in the world. So she knows that he is very easily swayed by her beauty. I mean, my God, he launched a nine year war against a foreign nation because she's so beautiful and he wanted to get her back. 
So she astutely says, maybe you should make the decision whether to keep her, bring her home, or to kill her before you even see her. And although that's a great suggestion, Menelaus does not take advantage of it. So Helen appears on the stage. Helen has a, an interesting, and I think for the most part, accurate, dare I say, um, logistical uh, 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 background for why she should live and why she should not be killed by her husband and why she should just be taken home. So her argument is, number one, it's Hecuba's fault for birthing Paris. If she had never given birth to Paris in the first place, none of this would ever happen. It's Priam's fault for not killing Paris in the first place. If you remember back to our very first class on September 14th, Paris was um, given this um, uh, um, prophecy when he was born that he would be the responsible for the destruction of Troy. And King Priam had the opportunity to kill him. And not that I think that that would have been a good idea, but he thought that he didn't have, you know, the, the energy or the, the, the bravery to kill his own son. So he would just sort of let nature take care of it. And so Helen, I think, rightly says, if you really, truly thought that it was possible for him to be responsible for a destruction of this scale, then you had no reason not to kill him. Then, of course, she invokes Paris's judgment of the goddesses. Now, this is something that the Iliad didn't touch. This is something that the Odyssey didn't touch because the Iliad and the Odyssey were on very different paths. But here we are back to the idea that Paris had a mission. He had to choose the most beautiful goddess in order to settle some quarrel among the goddesses. She claims that she is merely an evil genius. Her plot, as she would explain it, um, was to escape the, the clutches of Menelaus. She says Menelaus is a fool for having left her in the first place because he was just exposing her to the possibility of being kidnapped by anybody. And it just so happened it was a Trojan. She said that um, she should punish Aphrodite for Aphrodite's actions and not Helen's actions because it was not necessarily her doing. And then, of course, finally, her last reason is that she tried very, very hard to leave Troy but she kept getting seized again by the Trojans because she was Paris's property and she needed to be returned to her rightful owner. Which is interesting. We've never seen that in the Iliad. We didn't see that or hear about it in the Odyssey. But it is sort of commensurate with the experience of an ancient woman insofar as they were not listened to. <laughs> they were not paid attention to by any stretch. So... Um, you know, maybe maybe she was continuously seized by the enemy force. And yet, in our multi-part argument from Helen, at no point in time does she blame herself. Nowhere in this is an admission of her own guilt to say, hey, you know what? It is my fault somehow for some reason. Hecuba's response to Helen's argument is just as, if not more logical and more sensible and just as on point as Helen's arguments originally were. First, she said, this, you know, uh, judgment of a beauty contest has to be a farce. She says the goddesses would never lower themselves to a petty argument over beauty. Her quote is, don't give esteem to your crime by citing any idiocy of the gods. In this statement, she's actually admirably demonstrating her devotion to the gods, which is even more admirable if you imagine the fact that she has just lost her city and her family and her everything in life, and yet she is still utterly devoted to the gods and having a very positive image of them um, as, as, you know, a beneficial force in her life. Another argument, she said, if this idea of a judgment, of Paris's judgment, a beauty contest, contest is true, why didn't Aphrodite simply send you here magically instead of kidnapping you 
from Menelaus? Why did she go that extra step to arrange a kidnapping? Why didn't she just whisk you away magically and then you, you know, disappeared and Menelaus never heard about you again? She said, we have no evidence that you were ever kidnapped by force. This is true. Hecuba notes that while Helen was in Troy and watching the Trojan War, she said, Helen, you rejoiced at both Greek and Trojan success on the battlefield while you were here in Troy. You have no clear allegiance. So if you're going to go ahead and pretend that somehow you were taken by force and you really should have been with Menelaus the whole time, which is why you should live, then you should have exclusively been cheering for the Greeks. On the other hand, if you are this evil genius who arranged your kidnapping plot and now you're, um, you know, you're, you're happy with Paris and your place in life, then you should have been exclusively cheering for the Trojans on the battlefield. But the whole time you were playing both sides of the battlefield. And that's not fair. We don't have any clear sense of who you are loyal to, because at this point, all we see is that you're loyal to everyone. And then she said, why would you try to escape Troy? If you remember Helen's argument was that every time she tried to escape, she got captured again. Hecuba's argument is that a truly noble woman would have simply committed suicide. She would have taken her own life rather than deal with the shame of being in a place with a people that she didn't belong. And then Hecuba's final argument, which is probably one of her best, is that Helen has said all of her arguments splendidly clad. Helen is in the most beautiful clothing a princess could ever have. She has these ornate decorations and she hasn't suffered a bit. Hecuba is so overwhelmed with grief that she is lying prostrate on the, the stage. The other women are perceiving their burning city in the background. And here's Helen without a hair so much as moved on her head, who has the gall, who has the temerity to say, this is clearly not my fault. Well, if it's not your fault, then how come you are so unaffected by this? You can't possibly comment unless you're part of the discussion, if you're part of the, the, the cause of it. So Hecuba's argument is very clear and every claim blames Helen outright. So maybe you think, oh, maybe Hecuba would have won that debate. So if Hecuba wins the debate, what exactly do you think would be accomplished by murdering Helen? Helen shows no awareness of her guilt. She doesn't have any pity. She doesn't have any of those human emotions that would make her culpable at this time. Both women in their arguments are hearkening to the past. They're reminding the audience of the prosperity, but they're also reminding the audience of the way things used to be, thinking about a greener period of time. And whereas the Greeks, like Helen, are very urgent to return to that particular former state, the Trojans never will. So it's really futile to argue over this claim of who started the whole thing, because at the end of it, we can only think back to what has been. Because both victor and victim have lost everything that's been. The Greeks are overly boastful in their present. They will not have a constructive and foreseeable future. At least to a certain extent, these very few children women are emerging from this terrible situation with their pride intact. They have a very successful defense. Well, they had a very successful defense of the city. That was their past. But there are no gifts of victory in Troy. And there certainly will not be any gifts of victory on the home front for any of these Greeks. 
This is a really, really, really moving play. And Euripides is really, truly forcing his Athenian audience to look very critically and with a degree of empathy and pathos at their role as the tormentor in the war, as their role as the executor of the war. We know now, actually, that the fall of Athens was due in part to their greedy excesses. Um, they had success in war against both Persia and Sparta. And without going too much into Greek history, you should know that they did not pay attention to Euripides' warning words in the Trojan women. But I hope that this is a different view on the Trojan women for you and one that makes sense um, as a lens of suffering. Have a good evening.